um, it'll sort of, it goes through what the errors were, how to find the information, um, as well as sort of walks you through how we might resolve the, the issue. So let's skip uh, to step two. And I'll go back for the description here. Helpful to actually. So step two, we're gonna do a prescribed fault slip with the Dirichlet boundary condition in a static simulation and the fault is embedded within the domain. So prescribed slip, static, fault embedded with the domain. Um, so let's find out what our first error is. Okay, first error message picked up um, on step 02.cfg line 30. I heard it, year, very good. And so those of you who might, who are curious about how to sec set the non-dimensional length scales. Here's an example for a quasi-static simulation, say the non-dimensional length scales where I've set the length scale, the shear modulus, and the relaxation time. Okay, another error message. So again, a, a stack trace application, Time dependent problem, the formulation. Now I'm in the fault, fault cohesive kinematic. I've jumped through the SWIG interface. Here is my error message. Quadrature is incompatible with cell for fault, fault EXT. Cell 256 has four edges, but quadrature reference cell has three edges. So we went from a 3D, this is a fault, down to for 2D for the fault. So a cell with four edges is a quadrilateral. Uh, what type of cell has three edges? A triangle. So my cell is a quadrilateral. My reference cell is a triangle. Um, so let's find my faults. The reference cell is, uh, when we do finite elements, we have, a, we have sort of a reference cell that is a perfect square. And then we map whatever our sort of distorted square or in sort of dimensions in real space in X, Y, Z into this reference cell. And we actually do our integration on that reference cell and map it back to 3D space. Um, so our reference cell, we need our reference cell to be consistent with our mesh. Um, so let's see. We see. Do you see any information here about quadrature? Perhaps this line here? The dimension, it's set in the dimension two. Uh, let's ask Pyleth about uh, this component. So let's ask it about uh, let's get help. Components. Um, let's see, what did I mess up? Uh, fault under recess fault. Oh not equals. Did it, see, I need to be able to see what it, okay. Unknown component of that time dependent fault. So what did I mess up here? Time-dependent interfaces fault. Oh, uh, 
It helps if I specify the actual parameters. There we go. So it has a quadrature component. That's what's causing our problem. So let's get help on that. Let's get that up at the top. So my cell, that's my reference cell with the basis function and quadrature rules. Its current value is a fiat simplex. Um, and so a simplex is associated with triangles. And a fiat Lagrange is associated with quadrilaterals. So what I need to do here is instead of using the default, I need <laughs> to specify the correct type of cells. And so I would look in Appendix B of the Pyleth um, manual to see, you know, what other, what was the name of the reference cell for quadrilaterals? And, you know, what quadrature scheme is used for that? I would see, well, there's Fiat Simplex and Fiat Lagrange. Hey, I'll use Fiat Lagrange. That sounds like the one I need to use. If you look further, if you search the Pyleth manual for Fiat Lagrange, you would see that it's, um, that it is used for quads and hexes. In dimension two, it's for quads. Dimension three, it's for hexes. Um, okay, so what did I... Uh, uh, let's see, so... Yeah, Lagrange. Pyleth app. So it's not Pyleth app, it's just Pyleth. Another way is I could search the source code and find Fiat Lagrange and see that its path is Pyleth FE assemble Fiat Lagrange. Within Python, it replaces the path from subdirectories with periods rather than slashes. Um, and so that's another way. Um, that I could zero in on what the correct path is for Fiat Lagrange. So let's try that again. Okay. We have hit another error. We've walked down the application, the time dependent problem, implicit time stepping within the formulation. We're now in elasticity implicit. Uh, FE assemble. We have now hit. Uh, determinant of Jacobian 10 to the minus 7 for cell 0 is smaller than the minimum permissible value of 1 times 10 to the minus 6. The two most likely causes of this are highly distorted cells and non-dimensionalization with a scale that is much larger than the dimensions of the cells. So either I have a severely distorted cell or I've messed up my non-dimensionalization. Um, I can confirm with pair of you, what my aspect ratio of my cells are. So instead of, even if after you've gone out of qubit or whatever mesh generator it is, you can um, look at, let's, oops, let's see, let's go up to debugging. Here's my mesh, it's an Exodus file. Look at my surfaces with edges. Wow, I have, perfect squares, so let's just, for the sake of completeness, let's do uh, a quality, there is a mesh quality filter. <laughs> so let's see, where is it? Mesh quality, whoops, filters. Uh, well, surefire ways to look at it alphabetically. Mesh quality, apply, you'll see under information tab, oops, where's my data range? There's mesh quality. I scroll over, my minimum quality is one, my maximum quality is one. So I have perfect cells. Clearly they're not distorted. So that means my cells can't, distortion of cells can't be the problem. That means it must be that uh, I have a non-dimensionalization problem. 
So let's exit out of pair of you. Let's go back to our pilot app file. Where are our non-dimensional scales? Let's look at problem normalizer. Let's make sure problem normalizer help properties. So my length scale is default value of 1,000 meters, current value 10 to the 6 meters. Relaxation time of uh, norm, that's one year, so it's up to two years. Shear modulus is uh, the defaults. They're all specified. Anybody see something funny here? I see Diego nodding his head. Thousand kilometers. Um, so really what I meant is I either meant a thousand meters or I meant one kilometer. Um, I'm going to guess one kilometer is correct. Um, doesn't really matter if it's a thousand meters or a one kilometer. Okay, here we go. Uh, now we've walked down, now we're within the fault. And we get an error, could not find left lateral slip in spatial database final slip. Available values are left lateral or lateral slip, reverse slip, and fault opening. So it was looking for this value and it found that value. So uh, looks like I have a problem and it was for my fault. So let's look. Under our fault, it's using a uniform database. Right here is where it's specified. So if it's looking for left lateral slip, let's give it left lateral slip. And so uh, one thing I'll point out is that, you know, this is, you would get the, that same error message if even if it was a simple database, it would have said, here was the value I was looking for, here's the value I found. Um, and so instead of going, I would have started in the .cfg file for the faults, looked for the final slip database, and uh, if it's uniform database, that means the values are there. If it's pointing me to another file, then I would go to that file and look to see what values were given in that file. Okay. Um, Runtime error, vertex with label 396 on negative side of the fault, fault extension is constrained. Um, so what did I, when I said, so let's look and see if we can find this node set uh, in the Exodus file. Uh, where is that? Sometimes I feel like they show up and from the Exodus files, sometimes they don't. <laughs> Charles, where were you finding? So I'm not seeing the node sets showing up here. The ear? Gear. Gear. Oh, the gear. There we go. <laughs> so fault apply. Let's as Charles did, let's see, we want our point size to be nice and big point size eight. So here's let's see, I want to display let's show wireframe. So you can see now, uh, there's my, uh, I have an overlap between the boundary conditions and my fault. And what did I say the problem was? I wanted a buried fault, right? So I've chosen the wrong node set for my fault. Do I have to, there we go. So.
that's the actual nodes that I want to use. So instead of fault ext, I want to use fault. So where here we are. Instead of fault ext, let's use fault. Let's try again. Error computed orienting fault face cannot resolve tangential components into unambiguous directions. Up direction 001 cannot be parallel to face normal 001. If the face is horizontal, adjust the up dip parameter. Uh, my fault doesn't look horizontal, but let's follow the instruction and see if we can find out what's going on. So let's give it an up direction of zero let's see let's do what sort of what we did before for 0 0.1 0 0 0.9 see if that helps us so a little bit off vertical <laughs> Uh, zero vector in parallel. So I have a zero orientation. Let's, let's let's be a little more aggressive and see if that helps. It ran. Okay. Uh, so let's. Step two, let's look at what the fault looks like. Whoa, <laughs> is that what I expect my vertical planar faults embedded to be? So let me show you what the, let's bring in the domain as well. We'll show the domain as a wireframe. So there was my, uh, if I bring in, let's bring in the Exodus file as well. And let's bring in the fault. Uh, oops. Let's, we'll show it. We can show it as a wireframe as well. We need our, we need to show our points as big points. So, what do you notice um, about? the solid interface, the solid cells that I'm getting from the output and my, uh, the green vertices which define my fault interface. Are they the same? So my fault that I'm getting in the output, notice how it extends one cell away from my intended fault surface. So what has happened is Pilot has split this node, all of the green nodes Pilot has split and created uh, an interface with. On the ends, it's created, uh, it has not split this vertex over here, but it's split this one. So it sort of extends the fault in the direction of the fault plane. But down here along sort of the bottom edge, uh, it is basically arbitrarily chosen to extend the faults in a direction that is inconsistent with what I wanted. Um, so this is an example of where I have a buried fault and I have not marked the edge, my buried edge. So what I want to do is I want to come back here, up direction, this was, this didn't really matter. You'll notice that up direction is because our fault basically took a 90 degree bend. Um, and what I want to do is I want to sp specify the node set corresponding to my fault edge. So let's delete our fault output. We'll delete that as well. We can keep that. Um, let's go back, run pilot again. It completes, let's look at the output of our fault. Uh, we'll get the time dependence. Look at that. So by correctly specifying the buried edge, 
my fault surface ends up matching my intended uh, surface. And if I show what the slip is, you'll see that along my buried edges, by not splitting the fault there, it naturally forces the slip to be zero at the edge. So basically this is how uh, Pileth forces the slip to go from whatever value you specify in the interior of the fault surface to being zero at the edges of the fault. And that's what we want when we have embedded a fault surface into the middle of the domain. We can't put slip past the edges of where that fault surface is. And that's consistent with the fact that we have a basis functions that are um, at the edges that specify what that variation and slip is. Once we get to that edge of the fault, we want it to be forced equal to zero. Back several generations in, of, of Pileth versions, um, we actually, we did not do this, the effect of this buried edge. And so we had to make sure that our, we had to force our slip distribution to zero at the edge of our fault. Now, Pileth naturally will specify zero uh, slip at the edges because we mark those edges as being buried. So it does the natural thing and we don't have issues of sort of our faults extending off in weird directions past where we want them to go. So this was, let's, uh, let's get rid of that. Let's bring in our solution file. So step two, BTK. Um, there's only one time step here, so let's, we'll do displacement. We had fault slip. Notice that uh, let's deform by a factor of, I don't know, a thousand. Whoops, now we got to do it again. And you notice that uh, if I do the, let's see, let's do, We'll do wireframe. So there you can see I have zero offset at the edge of the fault on the ground surface. And then I have a dis discontinuity and displacement across the fault associated with the fault slip. So successful simulation number two. And you'll also notice down here, you can see how there is an offset even down here at the bottom edge also going to zero displacement. Yeah. Uh, let's, so, so let's see surface with edges. So we can turn off uh, the warping. So this is my fault surface. I have values of two on these nine vertices, a value of zero out here. And yeah, and so this corner down here, there's in, uh, I can sort of interpret this as the interpolation between these four points uh, is somewhat, right here at this middle is somewhat ambiguous. I have zero at this point, this point, and this point, and a value of two there. Over here, it chose to put a value of one there. Over here, it chose to put a value of zero. So this is, pair view doesn't understand the underlying basis functions in the fine element formulation. It just says, hey, I have four points and a cube. I'm going to put a linear variation in there. And in this case, it's ambiguous of how it does that linear variation. Um, and on this side, it did it one way. On that corner, it did it another way. And you'll see this whenever you have, if you have triangles, it's not ambiguous. Um, and so it's only with uh, quads and hexes that you get this um, amb ambiguity. So good point. Okay.